Hi, uh, welcome to the uh, FCC State and Local Government Webinar. Uh, this is a series of webinars that the uh, FCC's Consumer and Governmental Bureau, in particular my office or our office, the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs host. Uh, we moderate it, and we're lucky to have experts uh, from uh, several bureaus across the FCC to come speak to you, um, to our state and local officials and uh, organizations representing them about topics that we hope are of interest and uh, very pertinent to you. Uh, we really started this uh, series of webinars under this chairman, and uh, in the time in this time of uh, fiscal butt belt tightening, we know not everybody from across the country has the uh, means to come over to the FCC to speak with our experts. So we hope this is uh, really helpful for you guys out there. Uh, I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, you could go to the FCC uh, FCC's event page to to register for the webinar, and you could register via WebEx, and that would be helpful to us because that way we could capture your email and send you updates. Um, the proceedings here that directly impact you. Uh, if you don't register via WebEx, um, you can send an email to livequestions at FCC.gov, and we'd appreciate if you put registration in the email um, subject matter, and uh, that way we'll also capture your email. Please feel free to participate, email questions, tweet us, um, however, you want to, however you want to ask questions. Really, you could email livequestions at FCC.gov. You could tweet anything. There's also a conference bridge. So uh, we'd like this to be a back and forth more than a one way. Um, uh, we'd like it to be a conversation. And um, you know, this is your opportunity while you have uh, the Bureau's experts here. We're going to kick off um, today's webinar with the Public Safety Bureau. David Firth, uh, Deputy Bureau Chief, a stalwart of these uh, webinars is going to give a presentation. We're very lucky to have David. He was the acting bureau chief uh, recently of the Public Safety Bureau, and I think David's been acting bureau chief uh, once before, so we're really lucky to have uh, David's steady hand and deep knowledge of um, uh, public safety issues. So without further ado, here's uh, David. Thank you, Greg. Uh, and actually, at the moment, I'm, uh, my, my title is Deputy Chief. We have another David, David Turetsky, who is actually the, the Bureau Chief now. Um, so, but I'm happy, as always, to uh, present uh, a, a very brief update of some of the matters that the Public Safety Bureau is uh, addressing. And uh, I'll be making a presentation. Uh, I've got some slides, which I believe are being posted up for everyone to see. And uh, I will be going through those, but as I make my presentation, if there are questions, I'm happy to pause and take questions and try to answer them as best I can, whether they are on topics that are covered by the presentation or on, on other topics that are not necessarily covered. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, just an outline of the topics that I intend to cover in this presentation. Uh, I will be first uh, discussing the latest developments in the uh, ongoing evolution of the public safety broadband network uh, in the 700 megahertz band. Then I will be turning to next generation 911 and a number of issues that the Bureau and the Commission are addressing relating to migrating the 911 system from the legacy telephone switched network system to a next generation system. Then I will touch on narrowbanding and the current status of our narrowbanding process, which is coming to a conclusion at the end of the year. As I'm sure many of you know, we have a, a January 1st, 2013 deadline for the narrowbanding process. And then, time permitting, I'll, I'll touch on a few other public safety issues that uh, are active within the Bureau and within the Commission. And as I said, I'm happy to take questions uh, at any time during the course of the presentation. So I, I like to start, if possible, with a, a picture. Uh, and uh, in this case, a picture is truly worth a thousand words in terms of describing the changes that have been made to the 700 megahertz band as a result of what we refer to sometimes as the 2012 Spectrum Act, sometimes as the Public Safety Spectrum Act. It was actually a part of the payroll tax bill that was passed by Congress and signed into law in February. But the portion of the bill that uh, the Public Safety Bureau is most focused on is that portion that deals with the changes to the 700 megahertz band to further the evolution of the public safety broadband network that will have a home in that band. So the chart that you are looking at 
simply indicates the changes that were made by the 2012 Spectrum Act uh, in the band allocations uh, and the significance of those changes. So the, the, the lower portion of the chart represents the band plan that existed prior to the legislation. It is roughly color-coded so that the segments in red are the public safety segments and the segments in blue are the commercial segments. Uh, we are only looking here uh, at a portion of the 700 megahertz band. This is the upper portion of the band. Uh, there's actually also a lower portion of the band uh, that is uh, entirely a commercial commercial band. Um, so that the principal change that the legislation made was to allocate additional spectrum for use by public safety. Prior to the legislation, uh, public safety had been designated for a public safety broadband block, which was a 5 by 5 megahertz block, and there was also a 6 by 6 megahertz block of public safety narrowband spectrum uh, with a guard band in between them. Then when the legislation was passed, that public safety broadband block was uh, expanded to include the D block, uh, and therefore the public safety broadband spectrum doubled in size from 5 by 5 to 10 by 10. Public safety narrowband spectrum was not affected by the legislation, so that continues to be licensed to state and local uh, public safety agencies for narrowband use, which is why we have the PSNB designator on that portion of the band. Um, so as I'm sure many of you are aware, the Spectrum Act required that the uh, D-Block be reallocated for public safety and also created a new entity, which we call FirstNet, uh, which is an entity that is housed within NTIA, subject to a governance structure that's specified in the Act. Uh, and FirstNet is to be the licensee of the public safety broadband spectrum and will be responsible for the deployment of the network. So if we go to the next page, this is a very high-level summary of the actions that the Commission has taken to implement the Act. There were a number of tasks that the FCC was uh, required to implement when the Act was passed. The first of those, which had to be accomplished within a 120-day time frame from the signing of the Act in February, was uh, for the FCC to establish an interoperability board, which consisted of experts from the public safety community, from carriers, from vendors, to develop a set of technical recommendations that would be delivered to FirstNet for the minimum requirements that would be necessary to support interoperability in the public safety broadband network. And that statutory deadline was met. Uh, the interoperability board met during the spring, uh, developed a report which was submitted to the FCC uh, in May, and then in June, as required by the Act, uh, the FCC transmitted that uh, report and the recommendations in the report to, to FirstNet uh, via NTIA. And those recommendations uh, really lay the groundwork for what we all expect will be the first truly interoperable nationwide public safety network in existence uh, in this country or really in any country. And so that was an enormous first step. Other steps that the Commission has taken, uh, in addition to the Interoperability Board, uh, the Bureau issued an order about a month ago which implemented the directive from Congress to reallocate the D-Block to public safety. So that's also been accomplished. In addition, the Bureau has issued an order that resolved the status of both existing waivers that had been granted and existing waiver requests that had been granted to certain state and local jurisdictions prior to the passage of the Spectrum Act. And uh, it uh, terminated those waivers, but also established an STA process that would allow jurisdictions that met the STA standards to continue with early deployments uh, under very limited circumstances as FirstNet stands up. And so we have that process in place. Uh, an STA has been granted under that process to the state of Texas. Uh, and uh, we uh, are committed to follow through with that process on, a, on, on any other STA requests that come in, provided that they meet the standards that are set forth in the order. The real priority in terms of the statute and the FCC's transitional actions is to help FirstNet to get up to speed and to begin implementing its statutory responsibilities to deploy the nationwide network. One of the uh, actions that the FCC is tasked again with doing is to grant the license to FirstNet 
And that, uh, of course, first requires FirstNet itself to be stood up, and uh, NTIA appointed, uh, announced the appointment of the FirstNet board in early August, uh, and that FirstNet board had its first meeting uh, on September 25th, just earlier this week. So one of the first steps that the FirstNet board took was to send a letter to the Public Safety Bureau requesting grant of the license uh, as specified in the statute. Uh, that letter came yesterday, and so that request is is pending before us now, but we expect that that license will be issued in the near term uh, because, again, we are implementing a statutory mandate uh, for that license to be granted to FirstNet. There will be other follow-up steps that the Commission will be taking over the course of the next uh, few months and into the next year to take further steps that are associated with the transition of the public safety broadband spectrum with ensuring that there are technical rules in place that will protect both FirstNet and other licensees in the 700 megahertz band uh, from harmful interference and will ensure that they can coexist harmoniously in the band. So there will also be, uh, again, this is down the road a bit, there is a process in the statute for a state opt-out um, uh, request, which uh, occurs after FirstNet develops its deployment plans, uh, and the FCC will be responsible for implementing that. But that's also somewhat down the road. So right now what we're focused on is simply the initial steps to get the process rolling. With that, I'm going to turn to Next Generation 911. There are a number of issues that the Bureau and the Commission are looking at with respect to Next Generation 911, which, as I mentioned before, is the process of migrating our, our legacy 911 system that began with wireline 911 back in the 60s and 70s, which uh, was uh, augmented with wireless 911 starting in the 1990s. Um, that's the legacy network, the legacy voice 911 network, which works extremely well, but which is increasingly faced with technological obsolescence. And therefore, a lot of our focus is on migrating the 911 system to next generation technology that will fulfill a number of, of goals. One is to make the network more resilient and more reliable. Another is to enable it to support more means of communication between the public and 911 call centers, including text and ultimately photos uh, and video and other forms of data. Uh, this will also have enormous benefits for people with disabilities who have limited access to the existing system. One of the issues that we are focused on currently and that we will be likely, the Commission will likely be acting on later this year is text to 911 which, as we see it, is the first stage towards implementation of a full next generation capability that would support not only voice and text, but other capabilities as well. And there's been a lot of activity in the real world, in the marketplace, with respect to text to 911. Uh, there have been a number of jurisdictions that have initiated trials of text to 911. There is a trial that's been ongoing now for several years in Black Hawk County, Iowa a trial that's been going on for much of the past year in Durham, North Carolina. More recently, earlier this year, a trial uh, began in the state of Vermont, and most recently, uh, a trial between AT&T and the state of Tennessee began just uh, at the beginning of this month. So those trials have provided an opportunity to test the technical viability of text to 911, and also some of the consumer issues and some of the operational issues that face uh, 911 call centers and handling text. Uh, our general sense of those trials is that they've been very successful. They have provided a lot of valuable information to the carriers and to the 911 authorities that are involved. Uh, in addition to those trials, Verizon and AT&T have both announced plans that they intend to deploy text to 911 capability throughout their networks next year. That will leave it up to each PSAP, each call center, as to whether they want to accept text from those carriers, but the capability will be built into the networks, so that potential will be there for Verizon and AT&T customers. And what the FCC is focusing on, we have an ongoing rulemaking proceeding that we started about a year ago that sought comment on a variety of options for 
implementing text to 911 and other media, both on a short-term and a long-term basis. And we've been working with the record that's been developed in that proceeding, plus the experience and information we've learned from the trials and from the announced plans of Verizon and AT&T on, on what will be the next step. And we expect that the Commission will be addressing text to 911 in more detail later this year. Then in addition to text to 911, there are a number of other issues that relate to next generation 911 and also to 911 generally that uh, we have ongoing proceedings to deal with. One is the issue of location accuracy. We uh, about uh, a year ago adopted rules to, to further refine and strengthen the location accuracy rules that apply to wireless 911 calls currently, but we're also dealing with a number of pending issues relating to how do we ensure that as we develop next generation capabilities in the 911 system that location accuracy continues to be a, an essential part of that framework because location information is essential to rapid response. And we want to both build on the capabilities that have been developed in the legacy system and potentially improve on them through, for example, enhancing the ability for 911 calls to be located in indoor environments. Increasingly, uh, wireless calls are the uh, vast majority of 911 calls, and many of those calls are placed from inside, not just outside. And so it's important that we continue to extend location accuracy into the indoor environment. And in fact, uh, in uh, late October, on October 24th, we will be having a workshop here at the Commission that will be looking at some of the technological options for developing indoor accuracy. We also have ongoing proceedings on uh, 911 fees. Uh, under the Net 1911 Act, the Commission is required every year to report to Congress on the fee collection and expenditure by states and localities on 911 uh, services. We've added to our information collection this year to collect additional data on the extent to which those fees are being used for next generation as well as legacy programs. That information collection is going on now and we expect to be submitting that report to Congress later this year. And then a, th a second report to Congress that was uh, a requirement also from the Spectrum Act, the same act that, that uh, established the 700 megahertz broadband uh, uh, network and the, the establishment of FirstNet. Um, that act also requires the FCC to provide a report to Congress by next February on potential recommendations for uh, regulation and even perhaps legislation at the federal level to create the proper re regulatory framework for the development of next generation 911. So we will be issuing a public notice soon seeking comment on uh, and soliciting ideas for that report and we'll be delivering that report to Congress in February. Now I'm going to move on to narrowbanding. This is something that we have discussed in, in a number of previous webinars and presentations to state and local government uh, because uh, we know it's been on, on your mind as it has been on ours. Uh, we are now uh, getting very close, uh, less than three months away from that January 1st, 2013 deadline. We've been working at the Commission for months, actually now several years, on helping licensees to uh, create their path for compliance with the deadline. And we have seen, fortunately, a lot of progress uh, as we look at our licensing database to, for an indication of how many licensees in the UHF and VHF bands have narrow banded. We now see that, that well in excess of half of those licensees, both on the public safety side and the non-public safety side, have confirmed to the Commission through modification of their licenses that they have narrowbanded. There may be others that are in the process or that have completed it but have not yet notified the Commission, but we're very pleased with that progress. At the same time, we know that there are many licensees that are still uh, faced with the deadline and have challenges meeting that deadline. And we have been providing the same guidance that I will, will repeat once again in this webinar, um, which is that we recognize that there may be licensees that face extraordinary circumstances in meeting the January 1st, 2013 deadline. It is imperative for any licensee that is facing that situation to file a timely waiver request with the Commission. And a number of licensees have done so. We have issued a number of waiver decisions and are continuing to do so. And we expect that that process will continue through the next few months. 
we also have to emphasize, of course, that if a licensee is out of compliance as, as of January 2013 and has not obtained a waiver, then they are at risk. Uh, they are both at risk because they may uh, experience harmful interference, but they're also at risk because uh, the FCC Enforcement Bureau will be looking at compliance issues following the deadline. The Enforcement Bureau actually issued an advisory in August uh, that, that indicated uh, its approach to uh, narrow banding enforcement issues, uh, and we will be continuing to work with the Enforcement Bureau closely on that process. We also plan to issue guidance in the near term on post-deadline licensing and coordination issues, but the, the primary message is that the, the deadline is uh, in place. Uh, we are optimistic that, that the vast majority of licensees will meet that deadline. We will work with licensees that have legitimate concerns uh, that require a waiver, and we will do everything if they file those requests in a timely manner, which means not waiting until the last minute to do so. We will do everything to, to address those issues uh, in an equitable manner. But as of January 1st, 2013, new rules will be in effect, and uh, licensees that are not in compliance uh, will need to be aware that there may be consequences to that. Let me just end with uh, a passing reference to several other matters that are uh, of, of significance within the Public Safety Bureau. Uh, the first one is, in fact, something that is an extremely high priority within the Bureau, which is the, the ongoing investigation that we are conducting of 911 outages that occurred as a result of the, the derecho storm in late June of this year. This is the violent thunderstorm, line of thunderstorms that came through the um, uh, upper Midwest and then into the mid-Atlantic states, into West Virginia and Virginia and the D.C. area, uh, created uh, a lot of havoc, a lot of damage, uh, comparable, many people said, to some of the hurricanes that we've experienced, even though it was a much briefer storm in duration. And the particular issue that we're concerned with is that in a number of places, 911 systems were put out of commission or the carriers that were delivering calls to those 911 systems were, were put out of commission. They lost power and were not able to support the delivery of 911 calls, sometimes for a number of hours, in several instances uh, for more than a day. And uh, also the reports that we've received indicated that in some cases the backup systems that were supposed to kick in in those types of scenarios did not work. And so we've been engaged in a very wide-ranging inquiry into the causes and the consequences of these 911 outages. We have had meetings with all of the carriers that were involved in outage situations and with all of the 911 call centers that experienced outages uh, or experienced a, a disruption of incoming calls. We've been gathering information and will continue to do so. We also put out a public notice in which he asked for, asked for more general comment because we're not only concerned with the local effects of the storm in the areas that were affected, but also whether this is any type of indicator of uh, reliability issues that we need to look at more systemically. So that outage investigation is ongoing. We're also working closely with a number of state and local government agencies that have been pursuing their own inquiries of the outage. Uh, and we expect that we'll be providing additional information on the results of our findings uh, uh, later this year. Um, other issues that we're working on, another is commercial mobile alerts. Uh, this is the mobile alert technology that has been developed to send targeted alerts to uh, cell phones. And uh, to do so um, through uh, official government alerts from organizations such as the National Weather Service, uh, and to do so without requiring the customer with the cell phone in question to sign up for the alert service. So this is a, an alert system that was established by Congress uh, in the WARN Act a number of years ago and that's been in development for a number of years since then. We work on the technical aspects of these issues uh, while FEMA does the uh, implementation. Uh, and we're actually now starting to see issuance of these alerts uh, in many regions around the country. And uh, let me jump in here because um, I've, I've uh, fielded a number of calls from uh, uh, states, localities, counties, um, 
uh, your uh, engineering consultants working on behalf of um, you folks out there in state and local government. A lot of times we get calls, the CMAS uh, alerts, they're uh, targeted alerts, and a lot of times I'll get a call saying, well, you know, we have something hap help uh, happening in part of San Diego County, a flash flood or whatever, and the CMAS alert will go out to the entire county. But by statute, I believe, and I'm glad I have David sitting here next to me to correct me if I go wrong, the Warren Act, uh, the, the statute set the um, set the geographic area at the at a county at a county level and not smaller. Maybe you could uh, speak to that. And we, we, I think, here at the commission and certainly the Public Safety Bureau. Uh, folks know that's it, that's an issue out west where the counties are large. Well, and, and they're also, it, it's less a statutory issue than it is a technical issue, and it's an evolving issue because as the system is developed uh, and as more agencies sign on as, and as we work out some of the, the technical issues, we expect that actually the, the precision in the targeting of alerts is going to improve. Um, but there, is, there certainly have been instances that we're, we're aware of where um, an alert might be sent to an entire county even though it was an alert that, that was really only relevant to a portion of that county. Uh, and ultimately, we want to be uh, as precise as possible. Uh, we think that over time the technology will support that. Um, but this is going to be an evolutionary process. We're still standing up the system. There are still some agencies that are not yet using it, though we expect that they will be over the course of, of the next few months. There's still some variation in the types of devices that consumers can have that, that actually receive these alerts. Uh, the wireless industry has been working hard to inform consumers on which devices are capable of receiving commercial mobile alerts, and in fact, they have a different acronym, which is Wireless Emergency Alerts, or WEA, which they are using and which you will see in carrier websites and in carrier stores that indicates whether a wireless device is capable of, capable of receiving a CMA mass alert. So the, the targeting uh, is, uh, I think, going to improve. Um, there will certainly be instances where uh, you could receive an alert that is not directly relevant to you, um, but the intent is that they be targeted with as much precision as possible. Thanks, and uh, I, I hope that helps you folks out there. And we're, we're also happy to address specific questions, and in fact, we're interested in, in any accounts that people can provide of, of what's happened on the ground with respect to CMAS alerts and instances where uh, we can learn from the degree to which the uh, alert was, was, or not tar was or was not targeted to a specific area. Um, I know based on personal experience, I've received several re weather alerts that in some cases were uh, relevant to weather that was happening in my immediate vicinity, and in other cases it might be something that was happening within the general metropolitan area. Uh, so I think that that's something that, that we all uh, have to, to understand is, is part of the growing kind of evolutionary process of this system. Um, lastly, I'll just touch very quickly, since I think we're short on time, on a couple of other issues that we're dealing with. Um, we have a number of pending issues relating to the 700 megahertz narrowband spectrum, which you may recall was uh, a portion of the spectrum that was on that chart that I showed in the original uh, in the original slide of this presentation. Um, there are narrowbanding requirements that are associated with that band that are different and distinct from the UHF requirements that I mentioned before. They're subject to a different deadline, which is the 2016 deadline, and we have some waiver requests and some petitions asking us to push that deadline back. That's something that we expect to be taking up uh, in the near future. Uh, and then with respect to 800 megahertz rebanding, we are uh, in the latter stages now of rebanding in most parts of the country, um, though we are just initiating that process in the U.S.-Mexico border region because rebanding in the U.S.-Mexico border region required that we negotiate an agreement with Mexico to reconfigure the international allocation of the 800 megahertz band. Those negotiations were quite lengthy and quite technical, and I know this from personal experience, but we were able to secure and sign a formal agreement in June, 
and we are now working with Mexico and with uh, U.S. licensees to implement rebanding based on that agreement. So that's uh, good news that will allow us to to move forward with the last piece of the rebanding puzzle uh, on what's been uh, a, a very long uh, and, and complex journey to, to achieve the goal. The good news is that when we do achieve the goal, we will have uh, 800 megahertz public safety in a much better spectral position than it was prior to rebanding. The risk of interference to those systems will be vastly reduced, and uh, it will provide also some additional spectrum that uh, we will be making available to public safety that's freed up by the rebanding process. Uh, and in fact, I expect that we'll be issuing a public notice about some of that available spectrum again uh, in the near future. So with that, I'm going to uh, stop. Uh, if there are other questions, I'm happy to address them. And uh, I thank uh, the audience out there for your time and attention. Thanks very much. David, again, thank you so much for your time. Um, I know this is very useful. Last time, um, you know, we know we had uh, about 150 folks logged in from throughout the country, uh, some public safety experts, some not. So if you're logged on for your state or local jurisdiction and you have a question or, or you think you have an issue, go ahead and bring it back to your public safety officer and you could um, shoot me an email at gregory.vadis at FCC.gov or you could shoot it to David, david.firth at FCC.gov and we'll uh, try our best to answer your question or help you with your issue uh, if you don't have any questions right now. I think, uh, I think without further ado, we'll move on to our next, uh, to our next speaker and David, thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Again, we really appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. Can you help her? Hi. Um, great. Next up, we have a speaker from our Wireline Competition Bureau, Chin Yu. Um, she's going to speak about our rural health care, about the FCC's uh, rural health care program. It's uh, a part of the universal service program here at the FCC. Is that that's, uh, correct? Yep. That's and uh, I, it's, it's really... Um, it's a great topic. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, there are two parts to it, electronic health records and telemedicine. And, um, you know, uh, this should really be of interest to all your folks out there in uh, states and localities on how to reduce cost. So, okay. thank you so much. Thanks. Well, I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, it's been a very busy year for the rural health care staff. And there are two questions I want to answer today. Number one, what does the FCC have to do with health care? And number two, how can this help your state or your country or your city? Excuse me, your county, of course, or your city. And our hope is that even if you don't work directly on health care issues, you'll share some of this information with a colleague who does. So what does the FCC have to do with health care? Ah, thank you. Probably insert some kind of joke here about telecom lawyers not using telecom properly, but um, let's see. Okay, it's healthcare. Well, obviously, healthcare is a topic that's been in the news a lot lately, and basically, the two key issues that I think everyone knows is one, how do you improve the quality of care in our country, and number two, how do we do something about the costs? And the Institute of Medicine put out a report three weeks ago. That pretty much summarizes it. It's called Best Care at Lower Cost. And the interesting thing is they put out the, their recommendations, and if you see their graphic right there, the number one recommendation is use information technology more effectively. So you can kind of see right away what the FCC angle might be. Um, more specifically, our focus this year um, has been on healthcare and broadband not really just this year, but over the past few years, and a lot has occurred in that arena. Um, there are two major areas that I want to talk about with respect to healthcare and broadband. The first area is electronic health records. Now, the High Tech Act, which was passed a few years ago, is an incentive program that HHS is implementing, and basically it provides incentives and eventually penalties for physicians and hospitals to achieve meaningful use of electronic health records. Now, why is this important? 
Well, going back to the same Institute of Medicine report, it says 20% of patients reported that test results or medical records were not transferred in time for their appointment. Now, I have a feeling that some of you have actually personally gone through this. So you can see at a very basic level um, how important it is to be able to exchange these records. And in fact, the phase two meaningful use rules that just came out a month or two ago requires that doctors not only have electronic health records, but they have the ability to exchange these records with each other. So broadband and healthcare, part two. Well, this is obviously about telemedicine, which you can generally think of as providing healthcare remotely with the aid of generally a broadband connection. And I just want to give you some examples of what has been done through our um, rural healthcare pilot projects. Um, the one I want to focus on is the second one, which is a network statewide in South Carolina. And what they have done is they have deployed a tele-OBGYN um, service over their network, and it treats high-risk expectant mothers. Now, it's very important for these mothers to get regular care before they have the baby. Unfortunately, there's a shortage of um, OBGYN specialists in South Carolina that provide these services. And... As you can probably guess, the longer someone has to drive to see a doctor, the less likely they will go, especially if it's something that's preventative care. One of the physicians in this network actually had to spend a good three quarters of his day just driving to see patients all over South Carolina before the telepsychiatry services were implemented. Now, because of the network, um, he can spend... 30 minutes with each patient instead of six, and he has very little travel time. Uh, we have some other examples on this page. For example, teleradiology, just sending scans to a remotely located radiologist, um, and e-emergency, e-ICU services. So these are things where you can get a hold of a specialist right away, even if you don't have one employed in your own hospital. So great, so there's all these great benefits from telemedicine. What does the FCC have to do with that? Uh, well, the rural health care program um, provides a number of discounts for connectivity. Our primary program, we call that because it's the permanent program as opposed to the pilot program, has two mechanisms. One supports telecommunication services. For example, this would be a T1 line. And the discount for that is the difference between the rural rate and the urban rate. So these discounts are, are only available currently to rural health care providers. We also separately have an internet access program, which is for internet access services, and for that there's a flat 25% discount. Our pilot program, which began in 2006, um, actually supports networks of rural and urban providers. And it's a broader program. It, um, it funds the deployment of infrastructure, services, and equipment at a 85% discount rate. And the commission actually has an NPR amount to reform the program. And um, we are working on that. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that later. So, so who's eligible to apply for funds currently. Um, we have a number of limitations. These are the providers that Congress thought were important to focus on. Uh, first of all, you need to be public or nonprofit, and public includes government health care providers. Um, as I said, we only fund rural providers in the permanent program. Now, this includes circuits, for example, to an urban hospital. So if you have a rural hospital on one end and an urban hospital on the other hand, and that's eligible. Um, how do you know if you're, quote, rural? Well, we have a handy lookup tool that's on the USAC website, and there's the URL. You just go in, you enter in where you're located, and it will tell you. Now, in our reform rulemaking that's pending, we do have an open issue on urban eligibility for the program. And the reason for that is, I think, is going to become apparent when I talk about our pilot evaluation. 
There are seven eligible types of health care providers. Um, these are entities that basically provide safety net services to poor or underserved populations. And the list is right there on your screen. How do you apply for these funds? Um, well, as you probably know, USAC administers all universal service support mechanisms. Um, and their website is a good resource. Um, I've included their Getting Started page. And they also provide a very helpful welcome packet for the primary program that, in my opinion, pretty tells you everything you could possibly want to know if you're just trying to learn about the program, and maybe a little bit more. So I want to take a little time to um, talk about our pilot program because we put out a evaluation on this program just a few months ago. And we have learned a number of lessons that would be helpful going forward. So what did our program do? Um, we have 50 projects in 38 states, and they are all networks, whether they're regional or statewide, or in some cases, even multi-state. Uh, this is a map that shows where uh, we had funded healthcare providers as of January 2012. We've had a number more come online, and it's actually an interactive map where it shows more providers as you kind of zoom in. So I've included the uh, link to the interactive map in case you're curious about who's getting funding where in your state or county. Um, so let's see. Um, the, each of these networks are allowed to include some urban providers, although all of them must include some rural providers. And the red triangles on the map are the urban locations and the green ones are the rural. So I want to share with you some of the lessons we've learned from the pilot program because they've been very helpful to us as we're considering the reform proceeding. Um, and there are four lessons. First is that pilot funded networks have improved the quality and reduced the cost of health care in many rural areas. The second one is that consortium applications can lower broadband costs through bulk buying and create administrative efficiencies. Uh, the third lesson we learned was that most healthcare providers actually prefer to lease services from existing telecom providers. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean as the local incumbent carrier. There's all kinds of uh, resources out there, and the healthcare providers have been very creative in figuring out what exists and what's the most cost-effective solution for them. Uh, the last lesson is that there's a tremendous amount of added value to having urban health care providers in these networks. Um, I know we're running a little bit behind, so I'm not going to go, <laughs> go through all the examples here necessarily. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about the savings. Let's see. Uh, um, the trends and savings from the program. So, for example, the Telus joke example where you actually save someone's life by get, being able to get them treatment within a certain period of time. Um, the, uh, there's a telepsychiatry program in South Carolina over the same network that independently has saved the Medicaid program $18 million because the connections allow the hospitals to have 24-7 access to psychiatrists that means if someone comes into an emergency room and they're experiencing a mental health issue, they can do the triage right away. They don't have to admit that person and keep them in the hospital for several days until they can find a psychiatrist to come to that location. Um, another savings from having remote consults is obviously reduced transportation costs. We have a facility a hospital in California that's reported that they think their patients save almost $30,000 a month in travel because they don't have to go to Reno or San Francisco to see a specialist. And that doesn't count the amount of lost wages or um, time for their relatives and family to go with them. The second lesson we learned has to do with bulk buying. Um, we found that the pilot program networks were able to get much better bids and much better prices than individual applicants from our primary program. We require that to get support all applicants go through a competitive bidding process. But in our primary program, where each individual healthcare provider um, does their own bidding, only 16% of the funding requests actually receive a bid. 
And we think that's because the amount involved is not large enough for a service provider to, for, them to, for it to make sense for them to come in and actually participate. If you look at our pilot program, because we require networks, it's obviously a much bigger amount. You have more bulk buying power. And that reflects, that's reflected in the fact that 94% of our projects have more than one vendor bid. And we've had over 120 vendors selected to provide services in the program. Um, this next slide shows how this has actually impacted the bandwidth that healthcare providers can get. The National Broadband Plan recommends that small clinics receive four megabits per second, which would be the second bar on the graphs on the left. Uh, for a medium-sized practice, the recommendation is 10 megabits per second, and for a hospital, it's 100. Now, if you look at the primary program versus the pilot program, you'll see that most of the circuits bought through the primary program are 1.5 megabits per second, which is really on the low end for broadband. In comparison, if you look at the pilot program, you can see that the majority of providers appear to be getting services between 4, 10, 100. Um, and if you look on the right-hand side, this was a really interesting finding, which is that despite the fact that they're getting higher bandwidth, if you look at uh, that bandwidth tier perspective, in the pilot program, healthcare providers are actually getting speeds at 25, 50, 100 plus at an average monthly cost that is lower than what it costs in the primary program. And obviously we think a great deal of that has to do with the bulk buying. Uh, and I want to talk briefly about the urban healthcare providers for those of you who are in the city and wondering what all of this has to do with you. Um, we found that allowing urban providers to participate had a number of benefits. Uh, the first one, obviously, is that most of the specialists are actually in cities. Um, and so in order to do telemedicine, you need to have some incentive for the hospitals that have the specialists to participate. We also found that a number of uh, big city providers, whether they be uh, medical schools, for example, or nonprofit hospitals, um, did a lot of heavy lifting on the administrative side. And they provided financial resources for non-funded expenses. They also provided a lot of technical expertise, which you need when you're implementing a network at this level. And finally, from a technical perspective, a lot of these networks have urban hubs and rural spokes, which makes sense because um, a lot of specialists, again, are in the urban areas. And by funding the urbans, we were able to allow the networks to be designed in a way that made sense technically. Um, so briefly, I just want to talk about where we are in with our rural health care program reform. Uh, the commission issued a notice of proposed rulemaking in 2010. And in that notice, we proposed two new programs. One would be a health infrastructure program designed to help assist with deployment of facilities to rural areas where there aren't, where they aren't available, and a broadband services program to help fund costs for recurring services. Uh, the commission at the time recognized the value of gaining experience from the pilot program in doing the reforms. Unfortunately, a lot of the pilot programs didn't really um, get to a point where we could do the evaluation until earlier this year. So now that we've actually been able to do the evaluation and draw these lessons, we expect to, that to be very helpful in helping us to design a reform program. And we do expect to go to order on the reform program by the end of this year. Oh, yes. Okay, so if you want to help a healthcare provider locally get funding, what do you do? Um, other than the website information that I provided earlier in the presentation, um, this is at USAC. Uh, USAC actually has an outreach manager for the rural health care program. She's very helpful. I have given out her direct dial and her email, and I know she'd be more than happy to hear from you. And that's for um, application and administrative questions that you have, because USAC is the administrator. You can, of course, call us as well, but um, they have a whole mechanism set up to help with questions like that. 
and I've also added in my information and um, you know I'm happy to answer any questions you have email or phone about the program policy questions um, help direct you to someone who can answer whatever your question is if I don't know the answer so um, thank you very much for your time I'm happy to take any questions if we have them Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, this certainly has been very informative, and uh, <clears throat> it's nice to uh, uh, cover this topic and let, uh, let folks know what broadband is doing for them. And really, um, that's been the push of this uh, chairman's agenda since he uh, came on. Um, we, we put out our broadband plan, and um, so this is just one part of it, and it's really helpful. <clears throat> and I think that's a nice uh, segue into um, some more discussion from our professional staff at the Wireline Competition Bureau. They're going to talk about our annual, um, the FCC's annual Section 706 broadband, broadband progress report, which currently speaks to uh, the state of fixed broadband, broadband in the country. Um, however, I know uh, the, uh, the, we're in the process of uh, taking a look to see if that it should include mobile as well, and I'll let, um, I'll let our experts from the Bureau speak about that. We have uh, Denise Coco, um, Assistant Division Chief in the uh, Competition Policy Division. Matt Warner, a senior attorney in that division, as well as uh, Pamela Magna, a senior economist in the uh, um, competition policy division of the Wireline Competition Bureau. So I think this is uh, this is really uh, another sort of um, great follow-up to uh, really what the commission is doing with the with um, the push for uh, broadband deployment and adoption. Great. Hello, my name is Matt Warner. Uh, I'm an attorney in the Wireline Competition Bureau, works on the Section 706 Broadband Progress Reports. I'm joined with uh, my team lead, uh, Denise Coca, and uh, our senior economist, Pam Magna, around to answer any of your questions. The uh, little bit of background about these reports, uh, the Commission is required to report annually on the availability of advanced telecommunications capability to all Americans and determine whether advanced telecommunications capability is being deployed to all Americans in a reasonable and timely fashion. For the purposes of these reports, we uh, make broadband synonymous with uh, advanced telecommunications capability. And also a little bit of note uh, about how you see Section 1302 everywhere in the slides, uh, the, even though these are called Section 706 slides. Uh, yeah, thanks. Okay. And uh, the, the reason for that is uh, Section 706 is from the Telecommunications Act of 1996, and uh, the U.S. Code where it is amended is at Section 1302. For the, so for the purposes of the, these reports, you can uh, equate them. Uh, the next, uh, another obligation of these reports um, is to provide demographic information for unserved areas, and we do so in the latest report. And uh, if the Commission finds that broadband is not being deployed to all Americans in a reasonable and timely fashion, the Commission shall take immediate action to accelerate deployment of such capability by removing barriers to infrastructure investment and by promoting competition in the telecommunications market. So in the late, most recent uh, reports, the 7th and 8th report particularly, we uh, look extensively at barriers to deployment and what the com Commission has done to help alleviate those barriers. Uh, section uh, 1302D1 defines advanced telecommunications capability, and it's defined as high-speed switch broadband telecommunications capability that enables users to originate and receive high-quality voice, data, graphics, and video telecommunications using any technology. Now, the benchmark we set on this uh, in the last bullet point is 4.1 standard, and that came from a recommendation of the National Broadband Plan uh, for those to, for everyone to get sort of a high quality, um, as you know, we interpret it uh, for now, uh, video experience, uh, four megabits per second download speed, one megabit per second upload speed, and our latest report was released a little over a month ago on August 14th, 2012. The Commission has recognized uh, in these reports that great progress has been made. Broadband providers are uh, spending billions of dollars to help improve uh, broadband networks in these countries, uh, in, our, in our country, sorry. And um, so, so our, our situation is improving. Notwithstanding that progress, however, the eighth broadband progress report found that uh, 19 million Americans uh, are still without access to broadband, and that's 6% of the population. 
we further break that down in the report. So we look at rural areas. And if you're living in a rural area, chances are about one in four that you lack access to 401 broadband. And that equates to 14.5 million Americans. In tribal areas, nearly one third of the population there lacks uh, broad access to broadband. Even in areas where broadband is available, approximately 100 a million Americans still do not subscribe to broadband at any speed. So that's uh, even lower than 401. Because millions of Americans still lack access to broadband or have not adopted broadband, the report concludes that broadband is still not being deployed to all Americans in a reasonable and timely fashion. Because higher speed broadband is increasingly available, however, uh, and the market is ever evolving, we uh, bring up in the uh, report that in the ninth uh, notice of inquiry, which will tee up the ninth report, that we will begin to reassess our definition of broadband and uh, take a look at advanced telecommunications capability generally in these reports. So of interest to state and local governments in these reports, the eighth broadband progress report has the most accurate and up-to-date uh, information available. It uses uh, state broadband initiative grant data that was part of the Recovery Act and is used data used to fuel the national broadband map. You can go to uh, broadbandmap.gov and there – uh, if you have jurisdiction of a locality, for instance, you can look up the census blocks uh, that are in your jurisdiction and see what providers claim to serve those areas. And uh, if your experience uh, is different than the data, you can also say so in the map. So I encourage you to go to broadbandmap.gov. Uh, this is all, our first report to uh, ever include extensive data on mobile broadband and the availability of next generation broadband services. So we look at different technologies of mobile broadband and uh, see how many Americans are covered uh, by mobile services in addition to uh, looking at up to 100 megabits per second uh, service capability and seeing how many Americans are uh, subscribed there. So Matt, was the, uh, the data on the prior slides, did that include mobile or was that only fixed? The, the 19 million is, on, uh, is only fixed. Uh, we, we look separately at mobile. Okay. Thanks. Sure. That's a good question. Uh, also in the re report for the first time, we use the Form 477 data, which we were prior using uh, to determine the state of deployment in these reports, and used them uh, to determine adoption. Th this is a subscription-based data set. So uh, in an area, we uh, determine how many household, what percent of households were subscribing to uh, broadband for our adoption measure. Uh, the report also includes online interactive maps. Uh, you can see the links here uh, and go to them. They show uh, a fixed deployment map and a mobile deployment map. And uh, you can see uh, based on a county level where broadband is and isn't deployed. From the report, uh, some data. Are, are, this is the first table in the report. As you can see in the left-hand column, there's about 316 million Americans. Uh, next column, there's 19 million are unserved by uh, fixed broadband. And then we also break it down by household. So there's 119 million households, about 7 million of which are unserved, or about 5.9% of the population, households population. Uh, table two, we looked at uh, rural versus non-rural areas. And as you can see, there's 60 in the left-hand column, there's 61 million Americans living in rural areas. The uh, second call, the third column over, uh, says that 14.5 million of those are unserved. And in the final column, it shows 23.7% of rural Americans are lack access to 401 broadband. Uh, this is obviously very different than in non-rural areas, though 4.5 million Americans in non-rural areas also lack access. We also looked at, and here's some other tables, uh, tribal lands and uh, U.S. territories, you see uh, in tribal areas comprised of 3.9 million Americans, 1.1 of which are unserved by 401 broadband, and 29% uh, are without access. And the, uh, an even dire, even more dire situation in U.S. territories, we have 4.1 million uh, people, Americans living in U.S. territories, 2.2 million of those lack access to 401 broadband, or 54% of the U.S. territories population. A again, that's all fixed? That's all fixed. That's all fixed. Okay. That's all fixed. And make clear for... Yeah, yeah. We, we, we only looked at fixed in this report. Uh, 
reason is because uh, the mobile data is still being flushed out in a lot of ways, and so we're looking at that. And I'll get into that a little bit later uh, in the notice of inquiry, how we tee up uh, additional mobile considerations. Uh, so table seven, uh, we looked at adoption, and uh, as you can see, there is improvement uh, among all speed tiers for broadband adoption, and uh, this is spe specifically uh, home subscriptions. And, uh, but you see even at the lowest tier we look at that uh, a third of Americans are still not subscribing to broadband. Some of the appendices that may be of interest to state and local uh, government uh, officials is, uh, are, are listed here. Uh, of particular interest may be uh, Appendix D, which gives a county uh, by county breakdown uh, for um, all even if you have one unserved American in the county, it's listed and it tells ultimately the number of Americans in each county uh, across the country that are unserved um, for the unserved counties, uh, for, for counties that have an unserved American. Uh, also, uh, appendix, appendices C, G, and H uh, give state information, so breakdown of how many Americans in each state uh, lack access to broadband. The Appendix C breaks it down also by rural and non-rural in each state, uh, rural, non-rural areas. And also uh, the deployment rates and adoption rates for fixed broadband uh, are append Appendices G and H. And we also look at tribal lands and ENF and the fixed and mobile uh, deployment maps that I mentioned earlier and gave links for, the interactive maps, are included in the report uh, as appendices. So the ninth broadband progress uh, notice of inquiry. This uh, teed up the this tees up the ninth broadband progress report that will be issued. We released this inquiry a little over a month ago on August 15th. Uh, the inquiry initiates the ninth assessment of availability of advanced telecommunications capability to all Americans, including in particular elementary and secondary schools and classrooms, as is our mandate. Comments were due September 20th. Uh, 2012, so the first round of comments are over and some states have filed and we appreciate that. Uh, reply comments, the next round, are due uh, October 22nd, 2012, and we encourage everyone to uh, give us your perspective and file. Some questions presented in the ninth inquiry uh, that we teed up. One is whether just a basic broadband threshold is sufficient uh, or whether we should look at other core characteristics such as latency and data caps because of how they could affect, uh, for instance, high quality voice, data, graphic, or video telecommunications experience. Uh, for instance, latency uh, may be more dependent, uh, may be a more critical factor for voice than uh, a for one speed. And so those are the sort of issues that we'll be wrestling with in the next report. And feel free to weigh in on in the comments. Uh, regarding mobile services, uh, we did look at mobile services, but uh, because of the state of uh, the data, we uh, didn't have it affect our determination in this report, but we did ultimately conclude that uh, mobile and fixed areas, uh, for those who don't have either one of those uh, at 4-1 speeds, would still comprise about 14 million Americans, so it wouldn't have affected our uh, finding that um, uh, broadband is still not being deployed to all Americans in a reasonable and timely fashion. Uh, but we're, we're taking a special look at mobile services and its role. For instance, uh, in order to have advanced telecommunications capability, do you need both fixed and mobile in an area? Uh, or uh, in, because of the nature of mobility, also, do, you, do we need to look at beyond where people live and look at where they work and travel? Uh, so like so unserved road miles, for instance, uh, being an additional consideration for the next report. Uh, we also are looking at whether we should be including the multiple speed tiers as we did in last report uh, as part of sort of this look and ongoing look from the National Broadband Plan recommendation, among other reasons, for 100 megabits per second download speeds to 100 million homes by 2020. You know, is, is this report the vehicle in order to report that progress? What sort of aspirational uh, broadband speeds do we need? If they are, in fact, aspirational, what should be the thresholds that we, should, that we need to report? And then, uh, as always of interest in these reports, what actions can and should the Commission take to accelerate broadband deployment and availability? 
So uh, in conclusion, please uh, submit your comments. You know, the, uh, it's open until October 22nd, and it's docket 12-228. Give us your perspective, and our phone numbers are listed. Um, mine's the first one, and then uh, Denise uh, also is numbers listed. Please call us with any questions. Thanks. Thanks. That was uh, certainly very informative. And um, well, this report examines uh, uh, the, the actual current state and, and what we can do. There are other parts of the, uh, the Commission of the Universal Service Program. There's the uh, Connect America Fund out there that's uh, particularly looking to address some of the disparity uh, Matt highlighted in the rural numbers for uh, connectivity. So the, the Commission's been engaged on the um, broadband deployment and um, on the other half of that is adoption. But, but has been engaged on that on all fronts. So um, the Connect America Fund uh, really looks to address that rural issue. I don't know if um, uh, yeah. Matt or Denise, uh, they have certainly a lot more expertise in that area than I do. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we do discuss uh, the universal service, uh, what we're doing in the, our reform uh, efforts in the reports. And uh, we do also mention it in the notice of inquiry uh, as sort of, how consistent do these reports need to be with those efforts versus our mandate uh, under seven, se Section 706? And, uh, you know, certainly you would think that on some level they're, they're likely to be consistent. And so, but there, there are questions we ask in the NOI, and so we, we look forward to comments. That's great. Thank you. We just uh, uh, wanted to let you guys know out there that we're taking a real holistic approach here, and it's really um, something we're doing in all aspects and all bureaus uh, here, at the, here at the Commission. Anything? Anything else? Okay. Well, uh, thanks, Matt. That that was uh, that was uh, fantastic. That was great, uh, Denise. Pam. I, I don't see any questions coming in, but again, as uh, as uh, folks out there get time to formulate their thoughts or maybe talk to their um, talk to their experts uh, about some of the issues they uh, heard here today or want to submit comments or thinking about it, please go ahead and you could email me those questions, Gregory at FCC.gov. And uh, I'll work with um, any of our staff experts uh, to help get you the answer or let you know um, what you need to be doing to submit to submit uh, entries into the record. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. We really appreciate it. Next up, yep. Next up, we have. Um, we have our uh, Enforcement Bureau, um, Eric uh, Bash is an Associate Bureau Chief in the Enforcement Bureau, and he's going to be talking about um, the uh, examination of uh, prepaid calling cards. Uh, uh, this has been an issue that's uh, been brought to our attention. It's certainly a consumer um, uh, issue of interest to consumers out there, and we know we have a lot of uh, Assistant uh, Attorneys Generals on the, uh, out there watching. and. Um, they, some have been briefed before on this issue uh, at uh, another one of our webinars. So um, for those who missed it last time, Eric's going to uh, touch on those issues. Let me just help Eric get set up. Okay. Okay. So Eric may not have a slide deck. He may just be... I think he's just going to be speaking today, which is fine. Uh, not only do I not have a slide deck, I actually left my outline upstairs of walking me through uh, what I was going to talk about, but let's see if I can do it from uh, off the top of my head. And that's how we know Eric's the real <laughs> this issue. Um, so this mic? Yeah. Um, so as uh, Greg said, uh, my name is Eric Bash. And uh, I'm an associate chief uh, in the Enforcement Bureau. And just to um, help you navigate uh, through the bureaucracy here and to understand uh, where my office fits in and what I do, uh, the Enforcement Bureau, as its name suggests, is where uh, most of the enforcement work resides within the FCC. So a lot of the other offices uh, that you have heard from may be responsible for licensing. There may be conditions on licensing, uh, adopting uh, rules, policies. Uh, so the other offices do that. Uh, and after those license conditions are put into effect or the rules are put into effect and there are compliance problems, that's when that, in most cases, 
moves over to the Enforcement Bureau for us to take a look at and to determine what, if anything, needs to be done. My particular role uh, in the Enforcement Bureau is largely the oversight uh, in the what we would call the front office, the office of the Bureau Chief. Uh, my, I oversee primarily the Telecommunications Consumers Division, which is the organizational unit within the Bureau that, uh, as its name suggests, is largely responsible for enforcement of consumer-oriented uh, laws that the FCC has general enforcement responsibility um, of. Uh, one area that we uh, became active in uh, in 2011 uh, that uh, Greg asked me to speak about to you today involves uh, the subject of uh, prepaid calling cards. And as I'm sure uh, probably all of you who are listening to me speak uh, know what these are, know what these are, but just briefly, uh, these are cards that are sold for you know low dollar amounts, two dollars, three dollars, five dollars, something in that uh, range. Typically at convenience stores, uh, grocery stores, uh, perhaps online, and uh, the, you call an access number like an 800 number or a local phone number uh, that connects you to the provider's platform, and at that point you would input uh, your personal identification number, your PIN, uh, to connect the platform to your account, and then you're off and running and able to uh, call you know, a destination of your choice or certain uh, particular destinations. And uh, that's what the, the cards are. What we have found, and other law enforcement who, has, who have looked in this area have found, that a lot of the marketing here uh, is of the nature of on a poster or on the card itself, the point of sale, uh, some big type, a big express claim, 1,500 minutes to uh, Guadalajara, for example, for $5. Um, so just looking at that, you would assume that for the payment of $5, you would be able to, be, you would be able to make 1,500 minutes worth of calls to the advertised destination. The problem is that uh, there are different fees often associated with the use of these cards that... Uh, of different types, they might be maintenance fees, daily maintenance fees, connection fees, disconnection fees, different kinds of fees that can quickly um, erode the magnitude of the minutes that you can actually use for the dollar amount that you have paid. Often on the posters, or I believe on the hang tags that come along with the cards, which is a part of the card you know, like the, the, the card ha is, uh, comes with sort of like a credit card sized card and then there's something attached to the top of it that may have some disclosures on that's really designed to be torn off and uh, perhaps discarded. There are disclosures uh, on these hang tags and on the posters, but they're in very uh, tiny type uh, that really pales in comparison to the bigger claim that is designed to get the attention of the consumer to buy the card in the first place, and perhaps equally as important, uh, if not more important, the disclosures, if you get out the magnifying glass and read them, still don't help you understand what exactly you are going to get uh, for the cost that you're paying. So. Uh, just by way of example, uh, the disclosure might say that uh, a daily maintenance fee might apply of a certain amount. Some other uh, uh, fee that has an undisclosed amount might apply. So it's, it's not, uh, it's difficult, if not really truly impossible, for the consumer in these types of situations to figure out what exactly am I getting uh, for the $5 uh, that I'm paying, the announced number of minutes that the consumer might see on the poster or on the calling card itself or that might be announced at the beginning of a call when a consumer places it 
if he or she is ever able to get the announced number of minutes, it is only if he or she makes a call, one single call. So for example, I think one of the um, examples I actually brought with me, uh, although I didn't bring my remarks, I think said 783 minutes for $3. It's either to like Guadalajara or Monterey, Mexico. And I think 783 minutes, if I'm remembering the math correctly, is around 13 hours. So there certainly might be some teenagers that would try to make a 13-hour call, but most people are not going to make a single call of 13 hours. And again, unless that would be your use of the card, which seems highly unlikely, you're not going to get 783 minutes for the $5 that was marketed by this particular uh, provider. So that's basically what's going on. Uh, with the uh, the prepaid calling card matters that we, we looked at to uh, tell you about uh, legally what we've done about the situation. We contend uh, that this type of marketing uh, violates Section 201B of the Communications Act, which is a very uh, broad prohibition stating that carriers cannot uh, engage in unjust and unreasonable practices, impose unjust and unreasonable rates, and obviously our contention is uh, this type of practice is unjust and unreasonable. The general way that we go about uh, our enforcement, there are, there are different tools in our arsenal, and I'll, I'll describe some of the others in, in just a minute, but the route that we chose here and that we often choose is to issue a Notice of Apparent Liability, or NAL, against uh, the target that we believe has violated the law. And what the uh, NAL is, and this is a creature uh, created by uh, Section 503 of the Communications Act, that, uh, w you know, as the name suggests, we're giving the uh, target notice um, of the legal provisions that we enforce, that we believe they have violated, laying out the facts that support our allegation, and then we give the target an opportunity to respond, typically 30 days, uh, to say, no, you got it wrong, uh, you should uh, cancel the forfeiture that you're proposing, because that, that's really what we're doing uh, in the NAL. We're giving them notice of what we think they did wrong and what we propose the penalty to be for that uh, alleged wrongdoing. And then the target, as I said, can come back and say, we got it wrong, no, you've got the facts wrong, you've got the law wrong, we didn't do it, you're misinterpreting it, you know, whatever the argument would be, uh, asking us to cancel the fine, reduce the fine, uh, and then we will look at what the company says uh, in response and decide, you know, what course of action to take. The In the prepaid card area, with that background, we issued in 2011 uh, NALs against four carriers. Uh, I believe the, the date of issuance of those was sometime in uh, September of 2011. And then we issued another NAL against a fifth carrier in November of 2011. And each of the NALs uh, proposed a $5 million penalty uh, against the particular target for this conduct, so the aggregate uh, amount of these fines is $25 million. Uh, the stage that we are at in these uh, enforcement matters at this point, the NALs have been issued, the targets have responded, uh, there have been some communications with them about settling uh, the matter, but nothing like that has happened yet, and uh, it may or may not happen, and so we are considering in due course, uh, you know, where to go from here. Uh, keep your eyes peeled. There may be uh, more enforcement actions coming up uh, that uh, are along the same lines of, as those we have already taken. And I did want to mention that, um, as I said, uh, the NAL process is not the only tool in our uh, enforcement arsenal. We also can uh, 
seek cease and desist orders uh, in cases of uh, certain kinds of misconduct. And in extreme cases, we can also seek uh, license revocation. Those, as you might imagine, uh, have sort of different procedures uh, in place. Hearings uh, and examination of witnesses uh, might be involved in those types of things. But those are also uh, possibilities for us uh, in connection with our enforcement. Um, I also wanted to mention that something that we are uh, watching and cautiously optimistic about, and I, I will boldface and uh, highlight and underscore cautiously, uh, there is uh, a, an organization that has been formed, uh, perhaps not entirely, but we think uh, partly at least, in response to our enforcement actions uh, that is um, composed of a membership of prepaid card providers that are, uh, uh, they have gathered together uh, to, for, for one of their purposes, to try to attack some of the uh, marketing practices that have been the subject of our enforcement actions and to come up with uh, some best uh, practices for the industry to follow. So as I said, uh, we are curious to see what develops there. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, we will uh, be continuing to watch the uh, activity of providers uh, in the marketplace and where warranted uh, take enforcement action along the lines that we already have, if not uh, moving into different kinds of enforcement uh, mechanisms that I described just a few minutes ago. Okay, okay. Eric, that was uh, that was great. In a lot of ways, I think we were fortunate. You didn't you did not have a prepared presentation. I think that walked through walked the folks through it nicely. Um, obviously, Eric can't take uh, or the Enforcement Bureau can't take detailed questions about uh, about any ongoing investigation. And we're really lucky to have uh, Enforcement Bureau here to speak about what they do and really. Like Eric said, the Telecom Access Consumer Division is uh, one of the divisions in the Bureau that looks out for the consumer and is taking a pro-consumer stance. Um, so uh, I, I know it's uh, state AGs have a lot of interest in what they do. And I, I was just going to add, if you um, – I don't have any uh, uh, thing prepared to flash up on the screen, my contact information, but if you – want to talk about this topic further or have information that you would like to share with us, um, I'm eric.bash uh, at fcc.gov, uh, 4182057, or the uh, gentleman who is the chief of the Telecommunications Consumers Division, which as I mentioned, uh, is the group that uh, did this work. His name is Richard Hindman, H-I-N-D-M-A-N, so Richard.Hindman at FCC.gov, and his phone number is 418-3613. Thanks, uh, Eric. That was, that was really great. Um, and it, it certainly is a good overview of what you guys uh, do and what we're doing out there to, to help the consumer. Sounds like those uh, prepaid calling card ads are uh, about as easy to read as five parking signs put together in New York City, not to pick on New York, <laughs> trying to figure out whether I could park or not. Incidentally, I did get towed. <laughs> okay, uh, great. Uh, next up, we have uh, my colleagues from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau um, uh, to speak about the National Deaf-Blind Equipment uh, Distribution Program uh, and State Telecom Relay Service. Uh, they're, they're in the Disability Rights Office, and they're going to speak about um, programs here we have at the Commission to help uh, people who are uh, uh, hearing or sight impaired to help them uh, have uh, access to the uh, information age. Okay. And uh, we have Greg uh, Highblock, Chief of the Disability Rights Office, Susan Kimmel, uh, the Deputy Chief, and Rosaline uh, Crawford, uh, a Senior Attorney in the Disability Rights Office. And uh, I'll let them speak about um, uh, the issues today. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Just so you can envision what the, the setting in the room is like, Rosaline Crawford is seated to my left. The two folks who are seated in front of me are the sign language interpreters who will be converting my sign language into spoken English. I work 
as the chief of the Disability Rights Office. In short, our office is responsible for overseeing all aspects of disability access issues within the commission. We work in coordination with several other offices and bureaus within the commission. In a significant portion of the issues that we deal with, focus on access to the telephone system or telephone telecommunications. So a variety of services from uh, telecommunications via the relay service, as well as access to information presented on television, hearing aid compatibility, and a variety of other issues. We're here today to talk about two significant issues that are relevant to state and local governments. The first that we want to talk about is the establishment of a national deaf-blind equipment distribution program. And the other thing we're going to talk about is the certification of uh, renewing applications for the telecommunications relay service. Before I turn it over to Rosaline, who will be talking to you about the DeafBlind Equipment Distribution Program, I'd like to introduce a colleague who just joined us. She's seated to my right. This is Susan Kimmel. She's the Deputy Chief of the Disability Rights Office. And uh, once we complete the two parts I just mentioned, Susan will be addressing the handling of complaints. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Rosaline. Thank you, Greg. Uh, this is Rosaline Crawford. I'm an attorney advisor in the Disability Rights Office. I to talk to you about the National Deafblind Equipment Distribution Program that was authorized by uh, legislation that was passed in, in 2010 called the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act. Um, this legislation authorizes the commission to use up to $10 million every year from the Telecommunications Relay Service Fund to support programs that distribute accessible communications equipment to low-income individuals who are deaf and blind. In 2011, the Commission established the National Deafblind Equipment Distribution Program as a two to three year pilot program, and uh, the program was actually officially launched July 1st of this year. Still on mic? Thank you. Okay, the Commission has uh, granted an award to the Perkins School for the Blind to conduct a national outreach. Losing my mic here. Okay, the getting a new mic. <laughs> Technical problems. Issues with microphones. Okay. The Perkins School for the Blind is conducting a national outreach campaign for the equipment distribution program, and they are working with the Helen Keller National Center for uh, people who are deaf-blind, as well as uh, uh, Fable Vision, a marketing outfit. They have a website called iCanConnect.org. The commission also certified 53 entities, one entity for each state plus the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands to participate in this equipment distribution program. We allocated a minimum of $50,000 for each of the 53 certified programs plus additional funding based on the size of each state's population. So the larger states, California, Texas, Florida, um, receive more funding than smaller states, but every state receives at least $50,000. These certified programs um, are reimbursed, so they, they spend the money for equipment and related services, they submit their claims to the commission, and then they're paid uh, up to their annual allocation for equipment distributed and related services provided. And the related services are, you know, to get the word out in their state, to the actual equipment that they're distributing, installation, training users on how to use the equipment, uh, maintaining some repairs and, and the like. People who are low income and deafblind 
uh, to qualify for this program must be deafblind as that term is defined in the Helen Keller National Center Act, and they must have income that does not exceed 400% of the federal poverty guidelines. And we've issued uh, public notices that have information uh, that to actually include the a report in order that includes the definition and how we're interpreting it. Our rules also include the definition, the um, and also a, one of our public notices also has a, a chart that shows the 400% of federal poverty guidelines. Uh, equipment must be designed to make telecommunications, advanced communications, or internet access services accessible to the deafblind individual. These individuals have been historically underrepresented or not represented in our universal service program, and that's why Congress decided a little extra help here to purchase for them the kinds of equipment that they need to send an email, make a telephone call, access the Internet. This kind of equipment can be things like refreshable Braille readers. It's equipment that uh, sees the text on a computer and converts it into Braille, and then the individual who is who is deafblind who uses Braille uh, can actually read and understand the, the material. Um, the equipment can be hardware, software, it can be applications, it can be individual pieces or combination of pieces, it can be mainstream equipment or specialized equipment. And this program is intended to supplement not replace or supplant existing legal mandates or programs such as special education or vocational rehabilitation that may also provide equipment so that individuals who are who are low, qualify for our program don't need to exhaust all of the other programs but they need to kind of collaborate and work together to make sure that the needs of the people who are deafblind in your state are actually met so this is a, a supplemental to existing programs that may also deliver equipment. So if you are interested in learning more about this program and how can it help the people in your state, please visit the National Outreach Campaign website, iCanConnect.org. If you click on State Partners, you will find the uh, identity of the program that's certified in your state or you can go to iCanConnect.org, partners.php. There's also a phone number, 1-800-825-4595. Or you can visit the FCC's website at FCC.gov slash NDBEDP, and that will give you, send, you know, you'll find their links to uh, reports and orders, public notices, as well as a handy-to-use consumer guide and other information. You can give us a call or send us an email at dro at fcc.gov, um, and we'll be happy to answer any of your questions. And we're really hoping that this will set the stage for ensuring that low-income individuals who are deafblind have improved in universal and equal opportunity and equal access to uh, this, this technology I think that most of us take for granted these days. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to Greg. Thank you, Rosaline. This issue couldn't have been raised at a better time. We are approaching the deadline for recertification of uh, TRS providers. The current telecommun tel excuse me, telecommunication relay service program administrators throughout the country currently uh, who currently hold certification um, including 50 states as well as the District of Columbia and uh, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands those current certification holders will be asked to, to get recertified, so that, that current certification expires in July of 2013. And that's why this is very timely. As one of the four titles of the ADA, we're required to um, we're pro <clears throat> to provide a national <clears throat> telecommunications relay service. Um, each state 
was able to set up their own service uh, to provide both inter- and intrastate telecommunications relay service. Each of these programs now receives um, commission certification. Those who currently hold that certification are now up for recertification. Once certification has been received, that state is to provide traditional relay service, which would be TTY service. That was the first relay service that was offered. The TTY is a device that functions much like a teletypewriter. It connects to the PSTN lines and allows a user to make telephone calls. Services must also be offered in Spanish in this traditional manner using the TTY. Speech-to-speech -speech service must also be provided. The speech-to-speech -speech service is offered for people who have speech disabilities. There is a third party on the line, the uh, communications assistant, who is able to listen to and understand the speech of people with speech disabilities and then revoice in clear speech whatever has been said to the non-speech -dis disabled person. These particular services are required, but the states also have the option to offer additional services such as captioned telephone service. Caption telephone service is mostly used by people who are hard of hearing. In other words, people who often are able to speak for themselves but have difficulty hearing what is being said on the phone. They are then able to read in captions on their telephone what the party that they have called is saying to them. Entities that are applying for renewal of their state certification uh, must include information about the services they offer, the three segments that I described previously. They must also provide information uh, to document that they are meeting the requirements of the three programs that are required and that they are complying with the rules that set the minimum standards for the, pro for the program and that they are offer, offering appropriate oversight of the program. Certification lasts for five years. The intent of this process is to ensure that providers uh, perform in a uniform manner throughout the United States. Applications for certification renewal will be reviewed to determine whether or not each state TRS program has sufficiently documented their ability to either meet or exceed uh, the operational and technical and functional standards mandated by the Commission's rules. Current certifications will expire in July 26th of 2013. And under the current rules, states can apply for a renewal one year in advance of the expiration date. That would mean that they could have begun submitting renewal applications July 26 of 2012. Renewal applications must be filed at least several months prior to the July 26, 23 expiration time, though there is no preordained deadline. They do have to, this is in order to allow the commission time to review and re review and rule on the applications prior to the actual, actual expiration of their certification. July 25th of 2012, this past year, we sent out a public notice reminding the state TRS programs that they must submit an application for renewal no later than October 1st of 2012, which will be last next week, Monday. The timeline for state TRS certifications 
Um, this would be an ideal timeline, would be that in the fall of 2012, there would be a PN issued that would indicate that applications have been received by the commission and that we are seeking comment on those filings. Then between the fall and of 2012 and the spring of 2013, applications would be removed, reviewed to make sure they are complying with the appropriate rules regarding the operation, the technical standards, and the functional mandatory minimum standards. In the spring of 2013, any deficiencies that are detected uh, would be, a list of those deficiencies would be sent out to the states to inform them of their need to comply with the mandatory minimum requirements and that they are to demonstrate their compliance with those standards. By submitting and submitting any additional information that is required. Following that, in the late spring through July of 2013, a public notice would be released informing the states that their applications for recertification had been reviewed and that certification has been granted. Most states, public utility commissions, their PUCs, have taken the role of oversight of their TRS programs. We believe that most POCs are on board with this process, but if you f feel you need more information, please feel free to contact us. Um, there is a website that is displayed on the PowerPoint, or feel free to email me personally or Rosaline. Thank you. Now, Susan Kimmel will talk a little bit about our complaint process. Good afternoon. Uh, Rosaline and Greg have actually covered the two topics that affect states most directly that the Disability Rights Office has worked on. I handle many of the complaints that come into the Disability Rights Office, and uh, these reach us by fax, email, letter, telephone, and predominantly um, on a web form, the 2000C form. Now, uh, most of these complaints concern issues that relate at a federal level. Many of them are regulations that the FCC overse oversees, uh, such as closed captioning, uh, problems with some of the IP relay services, and uh, Section 255, which is accessibility to telecommunication services, among several other topics. Uh, so most of these would not be directly related to the state level of rules enforcement. However, a few things do come our way uh, that are related. Uh, either sometimes they're misfiled because the person has a disability, but the complaint is about something else such as service, and then these are redirected and often reach the PUC in the appropriate state. Um, just want a reminder that uh, in communicating with these consumers who have disabilities to make sure that your processes are accessible to all users. Um, one of the issues that is raised more frequently that has some implications at the state level is that of the distribution of broadband services, uh, mainly for deaf consumers who need to rely on video relay are on their video phone for communication with other people, um, they really need to have broadband services. And we find that some consumers, particularly in rural areas, have a very hard time getting access to broadband. So to, what, to the extent that you're able to encourage the rollout of broadband throughout your state, um, that would be a major advantage to uh, consumers in those areas, to deaf consumers in those areas. Uh, then just want to mention that some of the broadband plans 
whether they be uh, DSL, cable, satellite, or other sources of provision, uh, sometimes have data caps on the plan. And again, this is particularly in rural areas where there may not be the capacity to have a lot of broadband traffic, and so they uh, have a certain limit as to how much any one user can use within his plan. And this, although this may not be discriminatory in its intent, does have somewhat of a discriminatory impact because deaf users rely on this for making phone calls and video phones actually are very heavy users of the bits um, because it is a video service and it's not just a text service. And as a result, uh, the impact on deaf users is is very difficult for them to, to get the kind of coverage that would be considered equivalent to phone coverage for hearing individuals. So um, the extent that when reviewing various uh, agreements with cable providers or others uh, at the state level, this is something to take in consideration as to whether they might provide packages that have less of a voice component and more uh, broadband component for this type of user. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions people may have or if you would like to contact me about other questions dealing with the complaint process, you can reach me either through the DRO mailbox at dro at fcc.gov or you can email me directly at susan.kimmel, that's K-I-M-M-E-L, at fcc.gov. Thank you, Susan. Thanks, uh, uh, Greg, uh, Rosalie, and Susan. That was uh, a great overview of some of the things that uh, the FCC's Disability Rights Office are, are uh, doing for um, doing for people out there, and uh, and our role, and first the state's role, and um, some of the programs that are in place to to help folks. I think uh, that that wraps up our uh, program for today. Um, if any, again, if anybody has any questions they thought of um, or it comes to them in the next few days, uh, go ahead and email me, gregory.vadis at fcc.gov. I wanted to let everybody know that all, all the presentations that you saw today are up on the FCC events page. So go back, look at them, share them with your colleagues, point people that um, in that direction. And um, thank you for uh, thank you for your time and uh, for being our partners out there. Thanks.